I will randomly sometimes pull a journal off the shelf. It's 10 years old. What was shocking was as I read through one of those journals, I realized I'm dealing with the same stuff in this area that I was 10 years ago. And I was, I was like, why am I still dealing with this? And what it did is it allowed me to take that to the Lord and say, okay, this is clearly an issue that I need help with. How do I overcome this? So, dude, right off the bat, we were just talking just now before I hit record, and I didn't know this before now, but you have eight children. Wow. That's crazy. <laughs> like, I do? Really? I do? Yeah. Every time I hear that or say that, I literally think to myself, that's unbelievable. And I'm fine. No problems. <laughs> What's their age ranges? I have our four boys, four girls. The oldest son is 34. Amazing. He has three children. Our youngest are twin girls that just turned 20 in June. Amazing. Hey, I was yeah. one out of four and four. Four boys, four really? girls. Yes. How about that? Wow. That's pretty cool. And you seem you, you turned out okay. Man. <laughs> Ask my wife. Is I'm it? not sure about that. <laughs> exactly. Um, <laughs> so welcome to the show. I have to say Thank right you. off the bat, I was very blessed by your book, um, The Selling Formula. It was a great read. I loved it. Um, Thank you. There's a, there's a few things I want to jump in there and then talk about your journey. Um, okay. So for me, um, you know, entrepreneurship is a, is a topic that's near and dear to my heart. I, I, as an entrepreneur, I love the freedom that I get to have daily pu pushing my life forward. Um, and you know, that's one of the things that I was struck, struck by in your story in the book is just sort of your journey in sales and where you actually, you know, you you're self-directed as a, as a salesman, of course, working for other companies. But then at some point you started working for yourself or in partnership, you, you, you actually jumped further into that entrepreneurial journey. Can you tell us the story of sort of your early career and where it led to? Sure. My career was strictly Fortune 500 sales. Uh, first job out of college was with Coca-Cola USA. It's the fountain side of Coca-Cola and was with them for several years in two completely different markets where I cut my teeth on a Coca-Cola market. And then I got asked to go to a market where we only had a 10% share of Coca-Cola as a Pepsi market. And uh, it about did me in, honestly. <laughs> uh, but it was an incredible experience. So I left Coca-Cola and went to work for Johnson & Johnson and wound up staying with them for about 13 years and working in four different divisions. Three of those were surgical oriented, surgically oriented. Um, one of those was over seven years where I trained surgeons on advanced laparoscopy techniques and products called Ethicon Endosurgery. That was uh, quite an interesting experience. So a friend of mine approached me at about the 13th year with Johnson & Johnson and said, hey, how would you like to join me in starting a new company. I had the company car, company benefits, the notoriety of a billion dollar company going into the hospitals and they knew who we were, who I was. And so my wife and I prayed for about four months over this entire idea of whether to leave corporate America and then go to a company that had about $100,000 in sales. And I was the first salesperson wow. that was going to be part of the deal in a 500 square foot office. And we prayed about it. And before we made the decision, I had this dream. And I've only had two or three dreams in my life that, have, that I vividly remember. Back in the day, to give context, when the draft was uh, in effect, people that got their draft number called were committed to a two years in the military. So here's the dream, very short. I had a dream. I was walking in a line of men, hundreds of men. All we had on were boxer shorts. We're walking into the cinder block building, and there's one person sitting on a stool 
halfway down the building with a bare light bulb hanging from the ceiling. I walk up to that person. She's handing military fatigues and boots to each person that comes by. And she looks down at me and she says, Mr. Robinson, as she hands me the boots and the fatigues, you will no longer eat when you want to eat, drink when you want to drink, or do what you want to do. We'll tell you everything that you're going to do. And the dream ended. Wow. I woke up the next morning. I was like, what was that? And I started to dig into it and pray about it. And what I recognized was this. The commitment I was about to make, leaving corporate America and helping this friend start this business, there will be two years where I had no turning back. It was me basically being put on the rock and being (laughs) pummeled to become the better person I needed to become. And so I made that commitment. And it was brutal the first two years. And I had recruiters calling me to come back into the medical industry with incredible paying jobs. And I said no, only because of that dream. Did it work out? It worked out great. Was it hard? Hardest thing I've ever done in my life. What so <laughs> what did your wife say during the time the the two years of challenge and getting you getting those offers? Because I think this is a big topic that I think needs more conversation is for married couples, that entrepreneurship journey is, you know, it's not just you, it's you and plus all your family. And that can be really hard if you're the only one working it and they're behind the scenes. They don't know what the day to day is like. I mean, they only know what they, what you tell them, right? So what was it like for you guys for, if for her to hear about these offers you were getting, or maybe you just kept that quiet? Well, no, I, she was on board. We, again, we prayed for four months and really felt like we heard, okay, it's time to leave corporate America. The interesting thing is part of our story is I was six months in to this new career. I was at a conference and I called her because she was getting an ultrasound that day. I was at the conference because she was pregnant. We had six kids at the time at home. And people always ask, do you know what causes that? And I said, yes, I do. I like it. So that's fine. But I'm on the phone and I, she says, Brian, the, the ultrasound went great. The baby looks great. And I said, oh, that's so good. And I was about to hang up the phone. She goes, and the other one does too. I was like, what? what? She said, yes, we're going to have twins. Wow. <laughs> I was like, give me another beer. Uh, it was unbelievable. And so I'm like, okay, I have got to get off the road. And this was just starting. I was driving 1,000 to 1,500 miles a week. So to your question, she was focused, obviously, on having these twins and taking care of six other kids at the house. Yeah. Well, I'm gone three to four days a week. It was completely unfair, but she was on board. So I had to figure out a way to get off the road rather quickly and do everything by phone. And that's really the backstory on why the selling formula, the book, even came into existence. It was that whole journey of creating that formula to get off the road and do everything by phone. Wow. So the selling formula really wasn't, you didn't necessarily articulate that and create the framework until you needed to go into a completely different format or, or, you know, you're giving yourself the framework of saying, hey, this has to work. It's got to work this other way uh, over the phone. Yes. It was utter trial and error process. And then when things started to come together, I recognized this process is something that's duplicatable and I wanted to share it with others. That's awesome. I found the framework to be like I was nodding the whole time. And I got to say, I, I listened to the book. I love the audio book. I listened to audio books like crazy. And you did a fantastic job narrating that book, my friend. <laughs> Thank you for saying that. I just finished narrating my book and that's no easy task. Like, you got to stay in the right tone and the right mood and, you know, you know, it can't be way too hypey, but it can't just put your audience to sleep either. Like, it takes some energy yeah, too, it doesn't does. it? You did great. So yeah. nice job on that. Uh, the framework really is awesome. One of the things that I loved about it was its simplicity. You, could, you can actually, I find that some of the most amazing ideas in life are, are the, the, the simple ones. They may not be easy to put into practice. It's the practice that, that makes anything good. 
Uh, but the simplicity of it, I was nodding my head the whole time and, and it, I was connecting with the points you were making about my own entrepreneurial journey. And one in particular, and I want to ask you how, if, if and when you had an aha around this, but I, I, I connected to your point about having genuine curiosity for your prospect, an actual mm-hmm. sense of wonder of like, here's this other person. And they have a life and they're putting one foot in front of the other and they have challenges just like I have challenges. And what does their world look like? This this genuine mm-hmm. curiosity. For me, I had a breakthrough in my sales journey when that started to take hold. But how did that what was that what did that story look like for you? What I recognized when I started, I was so focused on how I was doing things. In other words, I was focused inward because I didn't want to screw up in my sales process. So what happened was I started to telegraph those feelings and those emotions to my prospect. So it was it was overtly off-putting, but people have a sense of whether you're being genuine or not, right? And so what I found was if I would just take the focus off myself and allow myself to stumble if necessary, in front of my prospect, they would they would embrace me as a person more freely and as a result, embrace and trust me and my solution. Mm. And then if I add to that the desire to deeply care about them and show them my sincere interest and fascination with who they are as a person, then it eliminates that whole sense of self-focus which is again is off putting in a sales conversation. Yeah, it sure is. Um, you know, for me, I, I know, and, and and let me just back up and say that, you know, f- for entrepreneurs out there who are listening, you probably already know the importance of sales. You know that this is that important thing, but it doesn't. It doesn't all. You don't. I really. Uh, relate to those beginning i can remember it like it was yesterday the beginning months or years when you're starting a business and you know the importance of sales and you know that you have to learn how to sell but you're lost because you're like what what what's going to make me effective how do i do it and then you get inside your head and you start to think okay but if i have the script and if i do this Mm -hmm. and you read these books and you're like but it, it in many ways, the more that you get uptight and bent out of sh- like, you know, um, anxiety, a- anxious about the sales process, the more that other side starts to feel like this person doesn't have their life together, right? There's like, yeah, I, I can't trust. I can't trust. And you might be so excited about this thing that you're trying to sell and you're like, okay, more hype or whatever. But, and then I can remember so vividly um, for me, I had just gotten a couple pretty large sales and I didn't, you know, before that it was like hand to mouth every week was like, you, you don't eat unless you hunt and kill. Right. Mm -hmm. And with this, I had breathing room for a couple, for a few months, this, these couple larger sales. And I eased down because I didn't, I went into some in front of some prospects and I'm talking to them and I, I can remember being like, um, you know, I'm fine if they don't if they don't buy today. Like everything's fine. You know? And in fact, I don't know if I fully want this work. I have to figure out if we're fully aligned. Like maybe I can be picky choosy here and like so I had this new attitude that was like let's figure out if this is a good fit or not. And my closing rate just skyrocketed. Just skyrocketed because they were drawn into this confidence and it was a it was a um they 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 felt take they heard they felt heard they felt like when i was got genuinely curious they felt like this person actually cares about this conversation we're having they're not just waiting for their time to 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 speak and uh that was a huge shift for me so anyways i don't want to make this all about me but i i was very very um connected to your story there when you're talking about genuine curiosity um and i want to seize on one thing one thing you just said and that is this anxiousness 
to try to stay, say what you want to say, that destroys the whole trust factor. Yeah, that's what Just I've be seen. At, be at peace and listen. Yeah. yeah something you said even um, about that step was even to pray for your prospect. When did you try that or get that idea or was there any particular sale? <laughs> like, like, how did that come about? It was constant. That's been part of my DNA is praying. And <laughs> there were times, and I know you can relate to this, Jed, where I was driving and going to my next call. And if, like you said, if I don't sell, I don't eat. And I would pull over to the side of the road. I was just crying out to God for help, sometimes in tears, because I needed to get a deal done. And that desperation, he kindly would remove so I could go in and just show up as an authentic person interested in who I'm speaking with. And that made a huge difference. When you think about that journey into um, a more entrepreneur position, less in a company selling for a company, but more, you know, I'm actually building something now. Um, what are some, what are some, key takeaways that you can remember about that, that transition for yourself. Um, you know, as, as like the two years, talk to me about those two years, like how much, how much hope did you have during those two years? Like two years is a long time. You know, I can imagine people, you know, someone else who doesn't, who didn't pray for <laughs> four months might just say, look, I got to just lick my wounds and go go to one of these nice offers that are coming in like what <laughs> what, what are how important is is hope during that time and did you get have glimpses of hope did you were there things that that were like shots in the arm yes i listened because i was driving all the time i was always listening to sales oriented marketing oriented content and i vividly remember asking for direction from the Lord on how do I get off the road? I didn't know any way to do this without cold calling. And I was listening to a CD series, <laughs> dates me, a CD series at the time from Joe Polish called Piranha Marketing. And one of the tenets of that teaching material was to lead, to generate leads, you create free recorded messages and you drive people to those messages to generate those leads. So I remember thinking, that's it. That is the answer. And I called my partner and I said, this is what's going to happen. I'm going to make free recorded messages on an extension at the office. I'm going to drive people to it. And he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I got to sell. We'll talk later. <laughs> <laughs> so I get back to the office. I record a message on one of the extensions. And this is going to date me. I did a fax blast to one of our states. Kansas that endorsed us as a company for our service. And it was fascinating what happened. Sent the fax blast out right around lunchtime. And our receptionist was inundated with calls to that extension. And I started generating leads that way. People left a voicemail saying, hey, I'd like you to call me. I got this, uh, got this fax, listen to this message. And it was the greatest overwhelming sense of, oh my gosh, I think if this works, I can get off the road. Wow. So that was, yeah, that was a great experience. So that's, that's a, you know, that's a pretty great story as it relates to marketing and, and what, and, you know, for me, I think a lot about the, how marketing and sales go hand in hand and be, having some type of system to get leads to, 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 to be able to um, to know that hey, this is working, and it's not just all. I mean, I've heard plenty of statistics about how salespeople who don't have to prospect eventually get lazy. That prospecting is important, but I know for myself, the luxury of having leads coming in, uh, uh, some type of steady flow of leads, has been game changing over the years. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, so. Let's fast forward a little bit. What happened with that company? Is that still, you still in that or did you exit or how? how? Still in it. Still in it. Yeah. Okay. Still in it. Yeah. It's, uh, it's been the hardest thing we've ever done, like I mentioned, but the greatest rewards come from 
those types of situations. And I was able to more than quadruple my income from the corporate world. Wow. When you make $10 a day, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but uh, it was, <laughs> it's been great. And you know, the, the beautiful thing is I have a book of business that I've been able to go back to and they renew, not all of them, but it takes the whole lead generation thing instead of if I live or die by the leads I generate, thankfully there's a book of business now that we've developed relationships with. We've taken great care of them and they want to renew their service with us. So it creates a whole different realm of life. Um, it's not passive income, but it's pretty close. And I'm super grateful for that. That's awesome. As it relates to um, the selling formula, I'm curious about this. I, I I know for myself over the years, I have, as a book of business has increased, as my relationships have deepened and there's been more trust that's been developed with customers, not, not you know, I'm, I'm sure like you, uh, my business is not very transactional. You're developing relationships and you're maintaining those relationships and it's like, the sale is great, but the customer is amazing. Like getting a customer is a really important thing. As as that has built up over time, I've noticed that my process has shifted to one that's much more just relational and friendship. And I don't find myself following as strict a formula anymore. Have you noticed that? Is the selling formula that, that you wrote about more important for the early days or is it just as appropriate now in this stage of, of when you're renewing with your customers? Mm. So from a sales perspective, when I have new potential prospects that I speak with, I use the selling formula process always. Mm. It's it's a proven way of doing it and it's it's just the way I approach new potential clients. With regards to renewals, that is for sure relational and it's a completely different animal. When you've got somebody that you've been in relationship with for, you know, three years, six years, nine years plus, yeah. you go back to, you still have to stay on your game. And one of the keys to our business, we have dedicated client service people that reach out to our clients every 30 days. So they're always getting touched. And I will call some of these clients back who I don't talk with for a couple of years because their client service person does that. And they'll say, oh, yeah, I spoke with so-and-so last week. And it's just so good to know that that model works and they, they feel those touches. That's awesome. So you and I uh, got to know each other because of your podcast, Real Faith Stories. And I highly recommend it uh, to anyone watching or listening to this. It's a fantastic collection of stories really deep, genuine, authentic stories, the deepest that you can think of, because this is talking about people's uh, relationship with God, with their spirituality. And um, I'm just so curious, because I'm a student of story, and I'm so fascinated with the way that leaning into story and storytelling really truly changes your life, I wonder if you can tell me about how your life has changed. First, tell me what led you to make that podcast and how has leaning into story and storytelling changed your life uh, in, in, as it relates to the podcast? Thanks for asking. When I released the book, The Selling Formula, I got on the podcast circuit and started promoting the book. And I found, and these were sales oriented podcasts, right? So some of the hosts that I spoke with did not have any relationship with the Lord. And one of the tenets of the book we've already talked about is praying for your prospect. So stuff like that, that you would view as a person of faith that would be quote, common as dirt mm. was a mind blow to some of these individuals with all due respect, I'm saying this. And so what I recognize, the Holy Spirit started to nudge me and say, why don't you consider starting a podcast? And I was like, uh, okay. What do I do? What direction do I go with it? And I had this sense, this kind of a mandate to start a podcast, but I didn't really have clarity around it. 
And so for months, I thought about it, and I'd go in and out of being serious about it. And then finally, it came to a head one night in January of 2020. I, I went to bed one night, and I said, Lord, either take this desire from me or give me clarity because I am sick of being in this middle ground. And the Lord, the next morning, kindly woke me up at 4.30, and I journal a lot. So he started to download questions about what is it that makes you cry when you hear a story? And I immediately started to think of several entrepreneurial stories that I'd recently heard that brought tears to my eyes. I was like, oh, these kinds of stories make me cry. And the Holy Spirit was like, then that's where you should focus because that's what makes you come alive. And I was like, okay. And what I do, I don't know if other people do this, but when I get a business idea or concept, I tend to look up web addresses to see if they're available Absolutely. around that. Right? So I started to I started to look up real faith, real faith stories, and real faith stories was available within five minutes, which was shocking, but not, right? I, I had I bought the URL for a grand total of nine bucks and I was on my way. <laughs> and then I just started networking. I started reaching out to the people that had touched me with their stories that I was thinking about and just had them as my first guests. That's awesome. Yeah, I love that. So having just written this book about story, storytelling, you know, something you just said a minute ago really grabbed me, which is that you journal. Uh, mm. You know, it, that that is, that is a constant form of, of documenting story. You, you, the story that's happening internally and externally as well. How how have you seen journaling change your life over time? Oh my goodness. If you were to come into my office and open up one of the uh, doors I have over my credenza, you would see journals that are 15 plus years old. I have journaled for over over a decade, probably several. And it has been for me, one of the most important ways for me to get what I can't articulate out. And I'll just free write sometimes. When I'm feeling this kind of like I'm blocked, I'll just start writing. And I'll ask the Lord, would you please help me see what I can't see right now? Would you help me get the feelings out that I know are inside that I need to articulate? And invariably, it just happened to me this morning, invariably that opens up my awareness, and it also gives me guidance on what step I should possibly take. Wow. I can uh, agree with that, that for me, journaling has been pretty important. I'm not as regular as I preach that people should be, uh, <laughs> but when I do get those out, and, and something Jordan Peterson said not long ago, he said, you know, you, you want, I'm going to, I'm going to get it wrong, but here's the, here's the paraphrase. He's like, you being able to think clearly is important. It's a, it's a worthy aim, you know? And when you write, you are getting these thoughts out and you're making sense of them and you're, you're clarifying them and you're restructuring, you're, you know, you're bringing order to what is chaos in your mind. And, uh, I know that that's happened for me. Uh, that's been just one of the most valuable things. There's also the sense of documenting time. Like, okay, I was there. And then this happened, and now I'm here. And that's, a, for me, that has been super um, powerful and to, to see the progress. Because day in and day out, we often don't feel the same, you know, we don't feel the progress. We don't feel the emotional weight of the progress like we should. Mm -hmm. But then telling that, writing the story, telling the story, journaling, I think is a, a very key way of feeling the emotion. Um, you know, what's been interesting for me, Jed, is I will randomly sometimes pull a journal off the shelf. It's 10 years old. What was shocking was as I read through one of those journals, I realized I'm dealing with the same stuff in this area that I was 10 years ago. And I was, I was like, why am I still dealing with this? Mm -hmm. And what it did is it allowed me to take that to the Lord and say, okay, this is clearly an issue that I need help with. How do I overcome this? Mm -hmm. So I've used that as a way to move forward as well, because when you're stuck inside your own bottle, you can't read the writing on the label. And I think journaling helps you do that. Yeah. Well said. Yeah. That's, that's what it is. It's a feedback loop to, to let you know, Hey, this still needs to be dealt with, you know, uh, that's pretty awesome. 
So now, real faith stories. Talk to me a little bit about what you've seen since you've taken a very active role as a storyteller and as a as a as a host, someone who's bridging uh, the gap and bringing people's stories to light. Um, talk to me about what you've seen f- from launching that. Yeah, podcast. I tell you my. What I feel like my role is as a podcast host, particularly with Real Faith Stories, is stewarding this very precious story from this very precious person. And so I look at this more than a host. Um, I've looked at it as a ministry, if you will, to that person to take whatever we're recording and actually be able to share it with future generations. Wow. Their story. So I look at this as multi-generational an impact for that individual as well as for the people that listen as just a story of encouragement. I don't mean to say just, but a story of encouragement. So I see it as two different things. And one of the reasons I've looked at it in the first way I described is when I had to teach myself editing, audio, (laughs) and, and things like that, it was overwhelming at first. And I had to tell myself, why? what's the bigger reason I'm doing this? And that's when I really felt the sense, this is something that can be used for legacy. So if I ever bump up against this exhaustion or feel like this isn't something I want to continue doing, I tell myself, this is not about me. This is helping somebody tell their story to their family as well. Yeah, that's awesome. I just recently heard of a phrase, something, I think it was called like, the, the podcast fade or the fade out or something, whatever, however they call it. But it's like a common occurrence that a podcaster will get something going, go for a while, and then eventually it just, you see fewer mm. episodes for, you know, <laughs> longer space in between the episodes and then they're just not doing it anymore. So that's pretty yeah. key that you can re- sort of remind yourself of the bigger why and keep mm-hmm. yourself going on that. I'm just in the beginning of my podcasting journey, so I still have a t- ton of energy, but... For me, it's very, very similar to what you're talking about. I feel like shining a light on the power of story and storytelling is uh, what I was brought to this earth for. And so wow. um, for me, it, of course, it dovetails into what we do at Votary Films and you know, helping articulate our clients' stories and, and share them and, and help them accelerate their holistic growth using story. But on a personal level, a lot of times those the topics in those films that we make don't always go to play to the places where I wanted them to go, like entrepreneurship and freedom and human flourishing, mm. right? And so, for me, this podcast is is all about that. Um, mm. what, you know, the sorry to interrupt, no, but ahead. the other the other thought with that that I left out was um, ultimately what I saw was there are a lot of entrepreneurs that I've bumped up against over the years that I've had connections with who have felt a nudge to take a step of faith in their business, but they're afraid to do so. And there wasn't, they weren't in a community or a place to get constant encouragement to say, you know, you're not, you're not weird that you are really hearing from the Lord and he really wants you to take a step of faith. So these stories, my goal is to have those, give that nudge a push so that they'll go to the next level because other people have done it. They didn't die, so I can do it too. I know. I think that there's this uh, built-in fear when you go into business and you stay pretty agnostic. And, you know, some people don't do this, but many entrepreneurs do. You sort of say you don't you don't necessarily break from cover and, and show the world what you believe. You're just a business. Yeah. Why would you do that, right? Um but then, and there's and there's sort of a built-in fear as you get some traction and get some success, and you say, "Am I going to lose that client? How many sales will I lose if I if they feel suddenly feel like they're not aligned with me?" And the same thing happens with politics. You know, oh, mm. they, I didn't realize that they saw the world that way. You know, politically or whatever. And uh, I, I think it's a I think it's a a, a fear that sh- is really unfounded because. You, that could happen. Maybe that maybe that happens, but I think it happens less than people, you know, less than they than you know. It's not, it's not as common as what you might think. And then when it does, it, the other thing that happens is, you know, you you're supposed to be an encouragement. Maybe that maybe someone who who you think is going to say, oh, I can't do business with them. 
maybe it's the opposite. Maybe they just get encouraged from the fact that you are having courage and saying what you believe. And of mm-hmm. course, it also attracts you know a, um, a whole group of people that believe the same as what you believe. So it it, it really is, I believe, a fear that that entrepreneurs should not have. I think you should be able to say. Now, I I also think that you can go too far and be just extreme, and you don't that that's not wise, right? I think if I think if people are humble and say, "I'm on a journey to to learn." You know, if 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 your general posture and general attitude is, I'm, this is what I believe, but I'm open and I I I have a I have a genuine curiosity, and I'm still on this journey. I think that that's I think that's a wise position to take. Um, yeah, I think I think you need to be really connected with the Holy Spirit, and He'll show you what to say or what not to say. I think what what not to say is just as important as what to say. In many situations, right? Great point. Great point. Um, talking about real faith stories, are you already surprised at the types of people that you're becoming networked with? Um, mm-hmm. You know, and and be vulnerable for a moment and tell us: Have you gotten as much traction as you thought you would, or is it beyond, or are you right on, or is it less? Like, talk to us about what you just stopped. Can you hear me? I, I can hear you. Can, okay, yeah. you're back. All right, um, internet the question, connection. The question, yeah, have I gotten as much traction as I thought I would? You know, I didn't know what good traction really was when I started. I just, it was, um, I did this out of a love to do what I felt like I was supposed to do. And a couple things I've learned. First of all, the people that I'm speaking with have taught me so much. Uh, it has been an incredible journey for me. Secondly, the amount of downloads that I get are not nearly what I would hope for. I would love to see tens of thousands of people listening to this every week. Wouldn't that be great? Yet, I get people who email me, and it's just at the right time, saying, I heard your podcast. I really want to connect with this particular guest. You had this experience. Yeah. Um, with one of my guests. I had another experience with another guest. And it's so gratifying to know that I'm being used as a connector Mm. as well to help people who are dealing with some really challenging situations. So it's the old story of the person walking on the beach and there's a bunch of starfish uh, washed up. And the other person sees them throwing the starfish back in, but there's thousands of them on the beach. And they go, why'd you do that? Well, it mattered to that starfish, right? So it matters to that person who reached out to me. So I really felt like the Lord said, I'm going to promote this. So I have to be diligent about what I'm doing. I want to do it with excellence and professionalism. And I've often felt sometimes, don't check the stats. Just let the chips fall where they're supposed to fall and let it, let it organically grow the way he wants to grow it. And that's hard for me as a type A person because I'm always checking stats, right? (laughs) So that's been the challenge. But overall, I really feel like I'm trending the way I should. And I I get that sense of community. And I'm also feeling a sense of maybe I should start a group with these people that connect with each other because they're incredible people. That's kind of a long answer to your question. No, that's that's great. And I think, you know, in, in our modern time, we're just kind of so programmed to think about like, oh, look at this YouTube video. It got a million views. Look at this TikTok. It, it blew up overnight or whatever it is. We have these sort of metrics and, and they become benchmarks for what we think is important or success or meaning, you know? Uh, mm, yes. And I loved your story right then about the starfish because it's really true. Like, you know, we, we have some of the same calls or, or emails where people say, hey, this really connected with me. And that's encouraging because it's like, you know, what, what is that? What's the greater impact of that over time? You know, we can't see it. It has this ripple out effect that, so, you know, I'm with you. I think it's, uh, I think it's hard to know exactly the impact, but you know, you, I think you just gotta be patiently persistent, but you, you do run a great, great podcast. I want to encourage you and just say that Thank you. you are on the right track. And I've been really impressed with, with, uh, 
with what you've got going on there. So I appreciate that. Yeah. Thanks. Awesome. Well, uh, I got to ask just a couple more questions and then we'll wrap up the, where do you, where okay. do you, um, where do you see, what are, what are some things that other than the podcast, are there other th- dreams and visions that you have, uh, that you want to tackle? I know that entrepreneur spirit doesn't go away. It's in there. It's, in, it's burning. <laughs> And uh, I don't know if you're anything like me, but I always am thinking of the next thing that I want to build and start and whatever. Um, do do you where do you land with that, and how much does it try to take you away from what you are running, as opposed mm. to you know, starting versus running? Powerful question. Over the years, interestingly, I have created several businesses in addition to the one I was in or still in as jump off points, as I felt like this is what I should do. And they all cash flowed, but at the end of the day, they could never replace what I was doing with the company I'm in. And so I started to ask the Lord, why is that? I feel these passions and I'm running in to do this or running in to do that. And the Lord asked me this simple question that has been a mantra of mine. It's this, what's in your hands right now? And I stopped and started to think, well, I have this business that you have helped me grow. And that's what I want you to continue to work on. But but I've got these ideas over here that I can do all this other stuff. What is in your hands right now? Now, that's not to say he's not going to course, course change. So that's part A. Part B is what I'm really feeling a sense about right now is related back to the selling formula. So that came out in 2018, podcast circuit, all that stuff. And I've just kind of set it aside. I get, you know, I get sales every month, a few. It's, it's not, it's not world changing from a dollar's perspective. But interestingly, about 30 days ago, I felt like I should do a video, just a quick two minute video, a backstory of why I wrote the book and how I think it could help people in phone sales. Because everything has moved, as you well know, primarily away from face-to-face to to Zoom or over the phone. And so I am going to do a video soon and throw it up on LinkedIn and tie it back to the URL I'm going to provide where you can get the first three chapters for free and just see what gets stirred up. That's what I feel like I'm the next step for me. And then as another step, um, we've got some very dear friends that are involved in real estate. And just last night, we were having a conversation with them. And we're, we're looking at probably partnering up and maybe getting involved in some stuff. So I'm pretty, pretty stoked about those other opportunities. And I'm still looking at what's in my hands and trying to be faithful with it. I think that, you know, it's pretty important to, to relay, especially to young entrepreneurs, to folk to to know yourself and to know that if you are a starter you're always going to have this shiny object <laughs> syndrome where it's like okay there's this thing over here and I really want to go after that and it's really exciting but the real traction like it's very it, it can be a never ending trap of always running to yes. the next thing instead of actually getting traction with what what's in your hands to use your phrasing so I love that phrase um and have you developed any any mental tricks or habits over the years to remind yourself of, Hey, what is in my hands right now to not, not get distracted or is there anything more that you want to share on that? There's a phrase that I've been using over the years when I look at something and let's say I'm tired or I'm struggling, I will stop and I will say, be kind to your future, Brian. What you're doing right now is going to affect your future self. So be kind to your future self. Be wise and make a good decision now that will impact you later. And that's been a great guide. And it also goes back to this acronym that Lou Holtz has been known to use, the former coach of Notre Dame, when, what's important now. And that's also a great way to get grounded in the moment and uh, make a good decision. (laughs) Hopefully. That's, that's great. Good words about uh, being kind to your future self. I've often said something similar like, what will I thank myself for later? <laughs> like, same idea. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
So that's great. Hey, thanks so much for being my guest. You've, uh, you really blessed me with your book and everybody should go check it out. It's the selling formula. You can get it on Amazon. Um, the, I especially recommend the audible version because Brian has such a wonderful voice. (laughs) I do have a URL, excuse me, to give your listeners. Okay. Um, it's Brian Robinson book dot com brian robinson book.com you can get the first three chapters there for free an audible version listen to them and if it makes sense you can pick up the book on amazon but it's been an absolute honor jed thank you so much for uh, the interview now the pleasure's been mine and everybody go check out uh, real face stories brian's uh, podcast there's some fantastic stories there 